Hi, this is Dr. Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics, and welcome to the Radiographics Audio Summary Podcast. Each issue, I will be highlighting a few of our articles that I think are important. From the Magna Cum Laude award-winning education exhibit at the 2017 RSNA annual meeting comes this article by Drs. Ann Kennedy and Paula Woodward from the University of Utah Medical Center Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences that reviews the use of spectral Doppler ultrasound for interrogation of the fetal vasculature. The article begins with a discussion of fetal safety as energy output using Doppler is higher than for B-mode imaging. The authors recommend that the mechanical index, an indicator of non-thermal effects, be kept at less than or equal to 1.0, while the thermal index should be less than or equal to 1.0 in first trimester screening with an exposure time no longer than 5 to 10 minutes. This discussion is followed by a review of the fetaloplacental circulation, with figure one illustrating the pertinent vascular anatomy. The vessels sampled to assess the fetal placental unit include the umbilical artery and vein, ductus venosus, middle cerebral artery, and uterine artery. Obstetric Doppler in the first trimester assesses the ductus venosus, which generates a sound likened to that of a washing machine. The waveform generated has three components, the S, D, and A waves. Reversal of the A or atrial contraction wave is always abnormal and is associated with aneuploidy. Obstetric Doppler in the second and third trimester is used to assess fetal well-being and to monitor the fetal placental unit. The umbilical and middle cerebral arteries are the most important vessels assessed. The systolic to diastolic or SD ratio decreases normally with advancing gestational age and is used to manage fetal growth retardation and to stage twin-to-twin transfusion syndrome. Absent or reversed end diastolic flow in fetal growth retardation can prompt early delivery. Umbilical venous flow is continuous with pulsatile flow and ominous finding indicating compromised right heart function. Ductus venosus Doppler evaluation in the second and third trimester is used to assess cardiac strain. Fetal middle cerebral artery Doppler is used to assess fetal anemia and in the calculation of the cerebroplacental ratio or CPR, which is a measure of fetal brain perfusion relative to that of the placenta. In fetal anemia, peak systolic velocity of blood flow in the middle cerebral artery increases. Uterine artery Doppler is used in the first trimester to screen for early onset preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction, while in the second and third trimesters, it may be used to evaluate pregnancies with fetal growth restriction. The replacement of normal, low-resistance, and continuous diastolic flow in the uterine artery by a high-resistance flow with a persistent notched waveform is associated with adverse fetal outcome. The final section of the paper states that assessment of the placental cord insertion site is facilitated by using color as compared to grayscale Doppler when the placenta is posterior or when there are multiple pregnancies. The antenatal detection of vasa previa or unprotected umbilical vessels traversing the cervix or within two centimeters of the internal os is a critical finding. Color Doppler has been shown to improve detection of this condition and can result in improved fetal outcomes. The most recent update of LIRADS in 2017 added ultrasound LIRADS as a new component of the imaging, screening, and surveillance of hepatocellular carcinoma. 
The authors of this paper begin by reviewing the rationale for the use of ultrasound in this setting, particularly the marked decrease in disease-specific mortality using every six-month ultrasound and alpha-fetoprotein screening versus that of no surveillance. The target population for hepatocellular carcinoma screening and surveillance, as defined by the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, is detailed in Table 2 in the paper. There are three ultrasound LIRADS categories that are numbered US1 through 3. Category US1 is negative. US2 is termed subthreshold, which reflects an observation or abnormality measuring less than 10 millimeters that cannot confidently be characterized as benign. These observations are followed with repeat ultrasound in three to six months, as contrast enhanced studies are unlikely to be definitive for lesions this small. US3 is positive and includes observations greater than or equal to 10 millimeters or new portal or hepatic vein thrombus. Appropriate management is determined by the ultrasound LIRADS category and is summarized in Table 3. Another component of the ultrasound LIRADS is the visualization score, which conveys the expected sensitivity of the test based on patient and intrinsic hepatic factors. The three visualization scores are detailed and illustrated in the next section of the article. Visualization A indicates no or minimal limitations. Visualization B reflects moderate limitations and visualization C, severe limitations. These scores are summarized in Table 4. The authors then review the technical standards for performance of abdominal ultrasound as recommended by the Ultrasound LIRADS Working Group Panel, which are summarized in Table 5, with Table 6 providing expert tips on improving liver visualization. The implementation of ultrasound LIRADS into clinical practice throughout the United States is then detailed, with an example dictation template containing the key features of ultrasound LIRADS offered in Table 7. In 2016, the FDA approved the use of fluorine 18 or F18 fluciclovine or FACBC, a radiolabeled amino acid analog taken up to a greater degree in prostate cancer cells than in surrounding normal tissues, for PET imaging of recurrent prostate cancer. In this review paper from the Brooke Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, the authors begin with a review of the normal physiologic distribution of FACBC. Figure 1 provides an illustration of the cellular mechanism of uptake of this agent, along with four other commonly used prostate imaging radiopharmaceuticals, including gallium-68 Pisma 11, F18 deoxyglucose, C11 choline, and indium-111 capromab pentadide, or prostacint. Conveniently, FACBC does not require an on-site cyclotron for its production. Potentially malignant uptake is characterized by comparison to the blood pool, bone marrow, and liver. Activity less than bone marrow is considered mild. Greater than or equal to bone marrow but less than liver is moderate, and greater than or equal to liver is intense. The normal whole body distribution of fluciclovine is demonstrated in Figure 2. Peak uptake of FACBC in prostate tumors and nodal metastases occurs shortly after injection at 4 to 10 minutes. Imaging typically begins 3 to 5 minutes after injection. The paper reviews the published experience showing the superior accuracy of FACBC as compared to pre-2016 FDA-approved agents for biochemically recurrent prostate cancer, prostacent and C11 choline. The data comparing recently FDA-approved PISMA-11 with FACBC in this setting remains limited. The protocol to be used for FACBC imaging is described and highlighted in Figure 4. 
The article provides an extensive review of the interpretation of FACBC studies, particularly evaluation of the prostate or prostatectomy bed, lymph nodes, musculoskeletal system, and solid viscera. Intracranial lesions, including primary and metastatic brain tumors, and pituitary lesions can usually be readily detected, as normal brain activity is less than that of the blood pool. Figures 20 through 22 show multiple examples. Infection and inflammatory processes can show intense uptake. Anatomic variants in the head and neck include prominent or accessory parotid glands and the lymphoid tissue of Waldeyer's ring. Looking forward, the authors posit that FACBC may be useful as an adjunct to MR in the primary diagnosis and staging of prostate cancer, given FACBC's higher sensitivity for nodal disease. This agent also shows promise in the evaluation of breast cancer. Although widely used in single photon emission computed tomography and PET, the use of photon counting detectors, or PCDs, for clinical CT imaging has not been explored, but possesses several intrinsic benefits, including increased contrast to noise ratio and dose efficiency, reduced electronic noise, reduced beam hardening and metal artifacts, extremely high spatial resolution, greater than 33 line pairs per centimeter, and simultaneous multi-energy data acquisition. This article from authors at the Mayo Clinic and Siemens Healthcare begins by comparing both conventional energy integrating detectors, or EIDs, and PCDs. PCDs use a direct conversion of photon energy into an output signal. Table 2 provides a detailed comparison. While still in research mode, PCD CT scanners offer potential benefits which are detailed in the article. Table 1 summarizes the clinical applications of PCD CT. The first is reduced electronic noise, which is a significant issue for low dose scans or scans in morbidly obese patients, where quantum noise is high due to overall low photon detection. Figure 4 illustrates this concept on the shoulder section of a chest phantom. The next advantage discussed is superior contrast to noise signal of iodine in a PCD system. As the low energy photons in a conventional EID CT system contribute relatively less to the overall detector signal than in a PCD system, where each photon is counted equally and therefore has a greater contribution to the image contrast. Beam hardening and metal artifact due to attenuation of low energy photons can be reduced as PCDCT allows selective use of the high energy photon signal. Figure 7 shows the comparison in a spine CT where metal artifact reduction in PCDCT allows visualization of the spinal canal that is obscured on the EID CT scan. The higher geometric dose efficiency of PCD CT, in which the septa between detector pixels can be eliminated owing to the direct conversion of photon energy, results in an effective pixel size of 0.25 by 0.25 millimeters. Figures 8 through 10 show multiple examples of ultra high resolution PCD CT in the wrist and chest. In PCDCT, simultaneous multi-energy acquisition is possible due to the inherent ability of these systems to discriminate photon energy. The user can set the energy thresholds desired and tailor this to the specific diagnostic task. For example, selecting energy thresholds below and above the K-edge for a specific contrast agent can help resolve different tissue types or contrast agents. As with standard dual energy CT, virtual monoenergetic and virtual non-contrast images and images with bone removal can be generated. 
A unique aspect of PCDCT is the capability to simultaneously acquire high spatial resolution and multi energy images. With EIDCT, one can either scan in dual energy or high resolution mode, but not both simultaneously. Figure 12 illustrates this concept in a pelvic CT. While technical challenges remain before the full potential of PCDCT can be achieved, this emerging technology has multiple inherent advantages that will hopefully be translated into clinical practice. In this musculoskeletal article, Dr. Mariana Silva and colleagues from Sao Paulo, Brazil, provide a review of congenital and developmental hip and lower extremity disorders in children and adolescents. They begin with developmental dysplasia of the hip, or DDH. This disorder is characterized by an insufficient coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. Sonography is the imaging tool of choice for evaluation prior to femoral epiphyseal ossification. The graph method of static evaluation is illustrated in Figure 1. Radiographic evaluation is performed after four to six months of age. Figure 2 illustrates the measurement of Perkins line, Shenton line, and the acetabular index in the evaluation of this disorder. In DDH, multi-detector CT and MR can be utilized selectively in complex cases. Slipped capital femoral epiphysis, or SCIFI, results in anterior and superior slippage of the femoral metaphysis. The disorder preferentially affects young male hips in overweight children and presents during periods of rapid growth, typically 8 to 15 years of age. Standard radiography is the first choice imaging modality for evaluation. Klein's line drawn parallel to the femoral neck should intersect a small portion of the femoral epiphysis in normal hips. The severity of SCIFI is graded by the Wilson method as mild, moderate, or severe, based on femoral head displacement relative to the metaphysis. Femoroacetabular impingement is an abnormality of the mechanics of proximal femoral movement relative to the acetabulum, and is divided into cam-type femoral abnormality and pincer-type acetabular abnormality. A standing AP pelvic radiograph and lateral view of the hips are the primary methods of initial evaluation. Characteristic findings of cam impingement on AP radiography include asphericity of the femoral head and abnormal femoral head neck offset ratio and alpha angle on lateral radiography as demonstrated in figure 10. CT or MRI are used to evaluate femoral neck and acetabular configuration and can detect labral pathology and secondary degenerative change. The article then moves to address congenital and developmental lower extremity conditions, which begins with a review of normal limb alignment and joint orientation. The concepts of the mechanical axis and anatomic axis are reviewed. The annotated figures 14 through 16 in the paper illustrate these concepts radiographically. Limb length discrepancy, or anisomelia, has multiple etiologies. A limb length discrepancy of greater than 2 centimeters is used as a cutoff for intervention. Proper radiographic evaluation is key, with conventional radiographs or CT scanograms used for appropriate measurements. Developmental or physiologic bowing is reviewed, followed by Blount's disease, which is characterized by age of onset as infantile, juvenile, or adolescent. Of note, the disorder is bilateral in 50% of infantile cases. Finally, in-towing and out-towing or torsional abnormalities are reviewed. Fortunately, the majority have favorable outcomes and do not require treatment. From the Department of Radiology 
at the University of Washington Medical Center comes this article that reviews patterns of blunt trauma related to specific mechanisms of motor vehicle collisions. After providing an introduction, the authors provide a systematic review of the mechanism of injury in motor vehicle collisions, beginning with a review of frontal impact collisions. In restrained passengers, seatbelts, while reducing morbidity and mortality from motor vehicle collisions, are associated with a variety of superficial body wall, head and neck, spine, cardiothoracic, and abdominopelvic injuries. Figure 6 demonstrates a typical seatbelt associated chest wall injury. Steering wheel and windshield related injuries in front seat passengers include facial, laryngeal or tracheal, and a spectrum of hyperflexion, hyperextension, and axial loading spine injuries. Thoracic injuries include chest wall injuries, while thoracic aortic injuries are the most concerning. Interestingly, while traumatic thoracic aortic injury in drivers likely occurs from thoracoabdominal compression against the steering column, the same injury in passengers is thought to result from upward traction on the aortic arch from the carotid arteries in a hyperextended neck given the known high incidence of head and neck injuries from windshield impact in these patients. Dashboard-related lower extremity injuries are primarily posterior hip dislocations, while floorboard-related lower extremity injuries include a variety of foot and ankle injuries. Lateral or side impact injuries have the highest incidence of driver mortality rates of all motor vehicle collision types upwards of 68%. Head and neck injuries are the most common immediate fatal injuries inside impact crashes. Lateral flexion can result in cervical spine or occipital condylar fracture. Figure 22 shows such a case with a C2 fracture and associated vertebral artery occlusion. While chest wall injuries and pulmonary contusions and lacerations are common, Rupture of the left diaphragm should be considered in near-side left lateral impact injuries, often associated with pelvic fractures and in 25% of cases with solid organ injury. The authors conclude their paper by reminding us that knowledge of the patient's type of motor vehicle collision impact can help focus the imaging evaluation and expedite the diagnosis of associated injuries. Immediately following this article is an expert commentary by Drs. Vincent Melnick and David Ballard of the Mellencrod Institute of Radiology at the Washington University School of Medicine. Thank you for listening. I hope you found these summaries helpful. Please subscribe to our podcasts and rate us on iTunes. This helps your colleagues find us much more easily. We greatly appreciate it.